Thank you, Milton. I do also enjoy my work. I don't just work to travel. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. I want to um, I want to just really talk about how we as a practice have started and how we've implemented telemental health. And I will try to leave some time for questions at the end. So the evolution of telemental health at our practice is what I'll talk about, how we implement and actually utilize it. Um, some issues that have come up along the ways that I feel are positives and negatives and um, methods that we've used to engage um, clients, patients, um, in uh, improving access and care. So Pacific Coast Psychiatric Associates, we are a practice that was started in 2006 by myself and Udi Zakin. He and I both finished our adult psychiatry residency in San Francisco. And we really wanted to do outpatient um, mental health, outpatient psychiatry. So we basically started the practice from scratch. And it was just the two of us. At that time, we were right in the crux of where medicine was converting to become um, electronic. Let's say EMRs were just starting in the hospital. Um, some hospitals, when we were training, 2002 to 2006, we were still writing paper notes and charts, but the main hospital when we did consults were electronic. Um, so we actually, Udi uh, Zakin, he was a computer science major in college, and he had spent some time coding. And so he was very, very um, uh, smart, I would say, and really pushing us to be as electronic as possible from the beginning. And so we started with a cloud-based EMR, and um, he and I actually had a practice management software that we used on the weekends and did our data entry to submit our claims electronically. Um, we realized our time was better spent um, seeing patients than doing data entry on the weekend. So as we really found systems that worked for us, we started hiring staff. Now, when Milton talked about uh, where we've come here, um, so we were cloud-based, which was only as good as your internet in 2006, and when we were in Pacific Heights in an old Victorian, our internet was not that great. Um, we actually did go to a second EMR that we bought and was on a server in the basement of our Victorian, which we thought was a great uh, idea until uh, I went to plug in my electric car uh, one day and unplugged the server, which then stopped working because it didn't have the right uh, January audit updates. <laughs> so anyway, then we went back to a third EMR uh, that is cloud-based. So I think the take home there is, you know, I'm going to talk about our practice and how we implement it. Yes, we were very tech forward from the beginning. However, we have had our hiccups along the way, and we have also had to change medical records. Uh, we've changed electronic prescribing systems. Um, we realize technology is much faster than medicine, and when medicine tries to keep up, there are companies out there that do one part of the system better than others, and so we have really tried to be adaptable. Um, so we now have um, three main office locations. We're in San Francisco, Walnut Creek, and Los Angeles. We have about 100 providers, and that's um, composed of psychiatrists and therapists, about 50-50, actually. Um, and we do the whole gamut of mental health, uh, children and adolescents, adult, um, psychosomatic, um, addiction, and geriatrics. We we really started, uh, just Udi and I, as we added people one by one, we really just started in a collaborative care model. And what's really, I think, allowed us to grow is every day at lunch, whoever's in the office um, will do a very informal case conference and have lunch. We also do, we have providers that just do telepsychiatry and teletherapy, and twice a week we do virtual case conference at lunch. Um, and so I think this, the work in mental health can be isolating at times in private practice, and this really allows for us to collaborate and keep up with different um, aspects of medicine and, and even technology that, um, that come to the practice. We, um, let's see, so San Francisco is where we started. It's that population that really has driven us to um, really move forward in um, telemental health. And um, we've kind of learned from one another, let's say. So we, um, you know, we actually really um, 
started doing video conferencing and used Skype early on in 06, 08, before there were HIPAA compliant uh, video conferencing platforms out there. And obviously, we all know Skype is not HIPAA compliant. However, that was when you had a college kid that was going to Prague for a semester, the difficulty of finding an English-speaking psychiatrist in Prague um, on, and how to stay, keep stable a bipolar patient, um, you, you know, we would just use Skype and then bill the patient directly because insurance companies at that time weren't going to cover that. So that we had already had that in the system. So um, four or five years ago when we were trying to really uh, vet HIPAA compliant platforms, VC was one of three plat um, pr platforms on the American Psychiatric Association um, website. And so we just tried them all and we thought VC was the most user friendly. So we have been with them since for, for several years now. Um, we do have, um, so in the practice, it's developed organically. So, you know, like I mentioned, people studying abroad. Um, so we, the, the single best sort of conversion rate for us for telemental health is um, when somebody actually has to late cancel an appointment, they have to miss an appointment because they're stuck in traffic, they're stuck at work, their child is sick, we offer them a video appointment in lieu of the in-person appointment. And it is surprising where, you know, someone does it once, and I see people downtown San Francisco that their office might be three blocks away, and they'll do it once, and they'll ask, can we do this again next time for our appointment? Um, and so it's, it's pretty awesome. So actually, 35 percent of all our office visits um, are video. And um, we do have 10 psychiatrists and five therapists that just exclusively are full time doing tele, um, telepsychiatry and teletherapy. However, like I said, we have about 40 psychiatrists and 45 therapists um, that are doing a hybrid mix. And I think, you know, the motto here for the conference, happy doctors, that part, I think what we're really realizing is the hybrid model has been really successful for us, that providers really appreciate being have able to have better work-life balance. They can work from home one or two days a week. They come into the office one or two days, uh, maybe three if they're full-time, and they get the collaboration that they want from being in the office, but then they also have the flexibility of working from home and still practicing. And, you know, psychiatry and, and therapy, I think there's no better part of medicine that um, lends itself to being, uh, uh, you know, utilizing telehealth more and video conferencing. Um, and so um, the other impetus for us in really getting to that 35% of all, all our office visits is we did do a, um, a we did a pilot with uh, United Behavioral Health Optum. They approached us a couple years ago and they knew how tech forward we were and they had asked us to do a direct to consumer pilot. So Udi and I at that time, this is 2015, we started with doing new appointments on video. And um, I think this is still a um, an issue that people, um, I think medicine's gonna take a while to catch up with, but I do know a lot of um, psychiatrists and therapists will require the first appointment and some of this is governed by state um, law as well. I know Texas just, I think, um, decided that it was okay to have a first appointment um, on video. But um, as the domino effect happens, it's going to take us a while. But here in California, we can do first appointments on video um, in the commercial space. So our bread and butter of the practice is dealing with commercial insurances. So that's about 95% of our uh, revenue. And so, um, and then also Facebook, they have primary care clinics, Crossover Health does primary care at Facebook, and they had found us on the internet and um, reached out, one of the primary care docs asking, you know, how to better collaborate with them. So we actually went down to Facebook and talked to them about our telemental health services, and um, we see quite a number of employees either in our city office or just exclusively via telehealth. Um, and I'm actually just, uh, I don't know if anybody from Cigna's in the audience, I was just talking to them a couple weeks ago about helping them with their intel um, population. I think they're having trouble finding psychiatrists and therapists um, for their members, and so um, going down there to just help educate um, staff there on how to really help them access our services. Um, so actually, this is how I'm, 
Oh, great, you can see this. So this is our website, and what we have done is we have really spent a lot of time on our website. So on our website, and everybody can go to this as they want, we actually have these tabs up at the top, and there are services, and under services, we, we do you know, an explanation of what is telepsychiatry and teletherapy. We also have a, a one and a half, a, almost two minute video that we created for patient education, and so it's actually really high yield video. Um, and when you go to the website, it actually just starts automatically, so you can see the video um, and how it's used. And we sort of, um, I don't want to spend too much time. I didn't want to show it today, I think, but please feel free to go to that because I think it's been very helpful for people. I also use this when I do demos with the insurance companies. Um, I'm about to do that with Blue Shield and Magellan next week as well. So just. Um, just there to educate people, because I think that's the number one barrier here, is just getting the word out of how to actually use it. So on our website, then, we, um, you know, we have a paragraph here on what's required. So people are surprised. You really just need a quiet spot and a smartphone, an iPad, a tablet, a laptop, a desktop. Um, and actually, people's cars are one of the best places to have a video appointment. Um, I have employees that will go out to their car or moms that might be in the parking lot running errands, but they're actually stopped. It's quiet. Not while they're driving, by the way. Sometimes I've had to do some patient education on that. But really, actually, the camera, um, the quality on the camera of the smartphones is by far better than you know my two-year-old Apple desktop camera. So um, it's really amazing. And I think at first people think, oh, you know, that's outside the frame of um, keeping the frame, as we call it, in um, psychiatry or in therapy. But it's actually um, really great, I think for people that maybe otherwise would not utilize uh, mental health services that need it. So um, we also have, let's see, um, so at the top you'll notice we have the virtual waiting rooms and then we have the new patients. So when new patients come, they can read about what telehealth is, if they have questions, and then they can actually book. And so we have this tool for them when they click on the new patient tab, this is what comes up. And they can find a provider uh, or they can register and schedule. Um, and we have all our provider bios on there they can search through. Um, and then they can book these type of appointments. So they just click on what they're looking for, adult, child, or teenager um, for psychiatry therapy, and then we also have a general evaluation, and this is really for people that maybe don't know what they need or aren't quite sure. So they click these tabs. Um, this is our paperwork, and so, you know, we specifically here talk about location and um, in office, San Francisco, Walnut Creek, Los Angeles, or a video um, as an option. And then we can see where, like, the, where would you like to book today? So it's very clear that video is an option, um, and if people have questions, they can always just go back to the main page and read about video. Um, and then these are some of our docs. If you click on video, who do um, video appointments, and then they can book. They just click the book now. Um, and this is, you can actually schedule an appointment, a new appointment or follow up in real time on our website. And so this will show availability. Um, you can put yourself on the wait list if there's an appointment time that's better for you, but it's booked. Um, and so we, we have spent a lot, a lot of time um, making this interface more user friendly, and we've realized that it really has worked as uh, we are almost you know, 99% full, our new appointments and follow-ups, and I think it's because of technology. If you cancel an appointment at midnight um, and someone's on the wait list, they get a text um, that, you know, that appointment is available, do you want it? Um, so I think oftentimes that appointment is filled before 9 a.m. the next day. So this is just, I was just demoing myself to show this screen of scheduling. So it's pretty, um, so you put in your email and your cell phone number and then you'll get a text message reminder and in your text message reminder will show you, there'll be instructions on how to um, log into your video appointment. So then we have, um, 
so that really the easiest way to log into your video appointment is just go to our website and click on that virtual waiting rooms tab. So when you click on the virtual waiting rooms tab, you'll see there's a list of psychiatrists and therapists and you can enter the waiting room. So all you do is say click on my name and then this will pop up. Welcome to Dr. Patel Dunn's waiting room. You put your name in. <clears throat> so this, I was not available, so I get a message. So one of the things we were worried about is if people try to go into your waiting room to give you an emergency message. Um, I think that's what we're most fearful of in, tele, in mental health, um, someone suicidal. And so um, anyway, they are notified. And then if you don't have VC set up, you, this will, it'll pop up for how to set it up. It takes about 30 seconds. I actually was gonna have somebody do it in here and demo, but um, I didn't wanna take up too much time. So it's very, very user-friendly. And then um, as you can see, people can um, join and then this is just the privacy and the terms of use, and then there you are. So if I'm, I'm on VC all the time, so then when someone enters my waiting room, um, I'll hear a ding, um, almost like a doorbell. Um, and so then I know someone's in my waiting room. Once you're in my waiting room, you can't, um, nobody else can enter once I'm in a session, so that's also something that's important for privacy. Um, okay, so just, uh, for the, sorry, I'm running out of time here, but um, I think that um, some of these things, obviously, I can talk more about, um, and if people have questions, um, I'm happy to answer afterward as well. Um, but just, you know, I think that really making it very user-friendly, um, trying to um, educate people, they just go to the website and walk through it. We also have staff that will help people um, some wrinkles to iron out, iron out, setting limits. Like I said, someone's driving. <laughs> I don't do an appointment. We have to do some patient education. Sometimes the internet is out and we go old school and use the phone. It's very rare, but you know, reality is things happen. Um, and I think that provider isolation, so people that just exclusively do tele-mental health, I think that's why I mentioned the hybrid model. Um, and then these are just some areas where some where maybe it's not appropriate, I think that's up to the provider when they do the initial appointment, but if someone is um, severely psychotic or anorexic and you can't quite tell, you know, they're wearing a baggy sweatshirt, would that be something better seen in person um, or actively substance using? You know, it's hard to smell alcohol in someone's breath through the computer, although I think we're getting there with technology, but not quite yet. Um, and so, and then, you know, just really the, the benefit too of you can have people join the appointment once you're in, getting family members and um, collateral, um, that's been really nice too, and just using VC and um, conferencing, video conferencing other people into sessions when you're worried. Um, just a bit on provider feedback. Um, so in my three years here, I've only had one patient that I banned from video. That's a doctor that said um, there were just safety concerns and they were worried about benzodiazepine dependence um, and they only wanted refills for their Ativan. I think this is just where obviously we have to use our judgment. Um, and then like I mentioned, the eating disorders. Patient feedback, um, transitioning to telepsych has been a seamless experience. It's easy to log in. Um, the chat program, so once they're in the waiting room, you can chat them to say, I'm running late. Um, so future projects using BC for group, prob doing testing, I know that's coming, um, and then of course access to other states. Thank you. Quick question, two quick questions. Do you accept Medi-Gal? And second is, do you have experience working in skilled nursing facilities? Huge demand. Yes, good question. So Medi-Cal, we do not. So there, there are more stringent requirements around Medi-Cal and Medicare. And um, we, I think, have really been able to implement and kind of move ahead leaps and bounds in the commercial insurance sector, and I know Medi-Cal and Medicare is catching up, but we're not there yet. So no, we're just commercial insurance, and we haven't gone to skilled nursing facilities. I think there's so many ideas we have, but there's only so many things two of us can do. Yes. 
So in the payments, is the same rule applies oh, in sorry. the telecyc also? In the payment model, the same rules applies in the telecyc also, like in the remote areas? And yes, the, uh, in California with our commercial insurance contracts, correct. And what about the Medicare and Medi? Uh, so we don't, we're actually don't, you, we don't contract with Medi-Cal and Medicare. Uh, so for the video only appointments that you have, how are you dealing with the Ryan Hate Act? Yes, so that's a really good question. So, you know, we have office locations all across the state. Um, there are some specific, um, so if someone needs stimulants or, um, you know, benzodiazepines, we will work collaboratively with the primary care physician. And, um, and so we will we'll make sure that actually, if we can document that we have a, they've, they've had an appointment with the primary care doc and we've had collaboration with the primary care doc that say their vitals and they're stable to be prescribed benzos or stimulants, we will, um, we will go ahead and um, we'll, we, we'll have them actually, we'll collaborate with them and we'll either have the primary care or pediatrician prescribe and collaborate or they actually will come into one of our office locations. So we're in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Walnut Creek and then you know smaller offices kind of here and there in Northern California. Yeah. Uh, you showed the patient registration uh, since virtually all your uh, uh, patients are coming from commercial insurance, uh, do they, Put in the insurance information also as a part of yes. that experience? Yeah, it's all in there. So it's um, you put in all of your insurance information, you um, sign our HIPAA pi privacy policies, you put in your release of information with your primary care doc or referring doc or therapist. Okay. So it's all there. Thanks. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Yes. Um, so. I've had a, a couple years of experience with using a VC platform, and I'm interested in your process of dealing with the high-risk patients who's actively manic or suicidal. So my understanding is you said that, do you have a, somewhere in there that says their chief complaint? Because how, you, how do you decide um, the algorithm that this is something not appropriate for a telehealth, telepsych consultation. So when I'm doing an initial appointment on video, is that what you no, mean? No, when the patients, because you self-book, right? So a patient yes. goes on into your virtual right. waiting room and they, they said, you know, I have suicidal ideations. Um, my understanding is it pops up saying that you're not available or then it sends you a text. How do you know this is a high no, 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 no. So that's if you're trying to get into my virtual waiting room. And, and self-book an appointment, right? Yes. So if you self-book an appointment and you try to, and so say you booked for tomorrow, but I'm on video right now and you go into my waiting room, I don't, there's, I'm, I'm a, you can't chat me. In the, vid in the waiting room. Right, so you're not doing smart, uh, what is it, uh, machine AI that's deciding this is a high risk, uh, do you no, know what I'm saying? No, we're not doing that. So that's Milton, is that something we could think about? Because it's, <laughs> it's something that would be important for that's her brilliant. to protect her wrist, right? Because that wouldn't, it's horrible. So if someone puts, I have suicidal thoughts, I want to kill myself, that's not going to show up on your text, right? Your chief complaint doesn't show up on your text. Yeah, I mean, we, we do have, you know, working with partners some AI, but I think that's the area is very difficult to do. So mm -hmm. right now, we really, it's just about just like, so you do require that your people aspect, as long as just. Do, you, know, do, do you see our clinical risk? I'm yeah. a PCP, so my yeah. chief complaint is everything, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I protect myself? Yeah. Something that should well, be seen in an do, ER, uh, not a virtual console. Since I worked on the product. So, I mean, these are not technical um, questions, actually. The platform has the ability to do things. Like, there's one way to resolve this kind of problem is uh, you have, uh, for, for general um, um, uh, primary care doctors, you can have um, uh, chief complaints, and, and you can flag certain chief complaints um, in there, there, like that, that you get a red, you know, like show up on your dashboard as red, so you will prioritize those patients maybe more. You can start texting them early on. Um, texting, being able to receive text from a, your patients is not a technical barrier either. Like, you know, it depends on your practice. You may not want to have all patients to be able to d text you directly, but we do have that capability. So another way to resolve it is for certain patients that are high risk, after you have an initial consultation, you can 
like enable them to be able to text you um, privately, like for people you're working closely. So that's yeah. also another way to address the problem too. Okay. Maybe Peter? Uh, I just want, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say with the virtual waiting rooms and the chat feature, it's one way. So it's only, if someone enters my waiting room, then I can chat them, and once I chat them, they can chat me back. So people can't just chat me all the time, so that's not an option for them, if that makes sense. But we can talk afterwards. Maybe do offline. Yeah, we'll talk afterwards. Sorry, Peter. go ahead. First of all, very impressive. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much you're doing. Uh, just on the volume of consults, I mean, my sort of back of the envelope thinking of what you're, you're suggesting is that you're probably doing about 50,000 consults a year. Is that about right? And where do you see this going in the future? Yeah, so um, for us as a practice, where foundation is outpatient mental health, right? And I, I really see it as a, I think you're correct. We probably have, um, that amount of visits a year. And I think that where we see it really is that, for us, what has really worked is this hybrid model um, where we have office locations in California and different cities, but then we, we can also offer video appointments. So one, that's access to people that you know can come into the office if they need to, but I think just knowing that they can if they need to. I've had somebody come down from Lake Tahoe where I thought they may be manic and psychotic down to Walnut Creek, which is you know a three, three and a half hour drive. They're not doing that every visit, but if I know they can do that and they know they can do that, like the quality of care I think is really phenomenal, so I do see where we hopefully will be able to at least solve some of the problems of access to care in California, and I hope that this will spread across, and I know it is, across other states. Because I think you're the biggest group that's doing hybrid work that I've heard about, and so you really need to write that up and publish it. We should talk, Dr. Yellowies. <laughs> maybe, since we're running run a little bit short on time, maybe uh, I will say definitely grab an issue yeah, during please. the break in there. So she's, again, so as an industry, we probably know that telehealth adoption is not that high. You probably hear she said she's walking with them, so many little things, secrets that she actually made her practice super successful. I can definitely grab her in there. So before, we actually also got a award for her. It's a game changer, our Oscar award. <laughs> so, Anisha, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Do you want to take a yeah, picture? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. See, we give out this award, we call this award the game changer again. So, I think because if you go to conferences, a lot of conferences, People talk a lot of the marketing hype in there, but in terms of actually impact, the changing is not that much. So we recognize for her to be able to just make in psychiatry, telepsychiatry therapy really, really work. So thank you so much. <laughs>